Let me begin to ask, please put up your hands, who here gets their household cleaned with chemicals and detergents, disinfectants, once a week, a few times a month? Put up your hands. Oh wow, there's a, quite a few of you. Who here also is germophobic? Put up your hands. Oh, there's a, there's a couple here as well. Okay. Well, what I'm about to tell you will likely shock you. Um, at best, I hope you will find peace with microbes. The miracle of life. I want to begin with one of the greatest memories I cherish is the birth of my children, Joel and Isabel. And like each and every one of us, we originated from one cell, one human fertilized cell that doubled and multiplied and became each and every one of us. Each and every one of us is made up of 10 trillion human cells. Pause. We are not actually entirely totally human. In fact, each and every one of us consists of, um, on average, a hundred trillion microbes. Within us and all over us, on our skin, we are more microbe than what we are human. If we were to take all the microbes from each of us, no, sorry, if we were to take all the microbes from one person and put them on a scale, they would weigh more than the size of a, than a human brain. That's more than three pounds. When each of us was born and we passed through our mother's birth canal, we acquired our first microbes. We formed that first partnership, that contract with microorganisms. The first touch we experienced of our mother or the doctor or whoever held us, there was a exchange of microbes. The first breath we took, the first microbes began to colonize our nasal system, our ears, our eyes. The first nourishment we took in, microbes began to colonize our gut. It's a beautiful partnership that began from our birth and has lasted all of our life from cradle to grave. Now this simulation shows you this interaction that we are experiencing right now. In this very room, in this very hall, we are sharing microbes. The person next to you, that touch, microbes are sloughing off to the next person and vice versa. As I speak, microbes are carried from my breath into tiny droplets. And I apologize for those in the front, you're experiencing a few of my microbes than everyone else. But some of these microbes, I noticed as I was sitting here, there's an air current. Microbes are floating everywhere. As I scratch my hair, microbes are coming off it and we'll be traveling with air currents. They're everywhere. They're on our skin and inside of us. And in fact, there is something more that we share than microbes in this very room. Every second breath that you take has a link to microbes. 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere is produced by microbes. Microalgae in particular, phytoplankton. This image here shows you the various regions in the seas and oceans, these, these green patches that you see, these are phytoplankton blooms. These are essentially the rainforests of the sea, producing 50% of the oxygen in our atmosphere, that which is in every second breath that you take. These microbes are essentially the sustenance that sustains life on this planet. Now, what if, for an instant, I can pull out a wand and extinguish all microbes from this planet? from everywhere. What if we got rid of the bacteria, the yeast and the micro, um, microscopic fungi, got rid of microalgae as well? Let's get rid of those. There would be some good things. We wouldn't be getting colds and flus, various illnesses from microorganisms, all gone. There wouldn't be any food poisoning, so we wouldn't be driving the porcelain wheel on the toilet. There also wouldn't be outbreaks like cholera and Ebola and various other diseases. Sounds pretty wonderful. There also wouldn't be food spoilage. Fruits and vegetables on your tables will last for months. Sounds pretty wonderful. No body odor as well. Those smelly armpits and bad breath. A trip on the bus might be a bit more pleasant. And there wouldn't be microalgal blooms that produce toxic uh, um, neurotoxins. And there will also not be uh, food spoilage, uh, shellfish poisoning, for example. All gone, sounds pretty wonderful. But there are a few things we'd be missing out on, a few quite important things we'd be missing out on. For example, yogurts, 
Beer, I think for me that'll do it. Is getting, getting rid of beer would do it for me. I'd want those microbes back. Wine, alcoholic drinks and beverages, bread, cheeses and vinegar as well. And these are just a few examples that we'd be missing out on. Not to mention all that oxygen in our atmosphere that we breathe that's so important to life on this planet. In our gut, there are more bacteria than there are stars in our galaxy. Many of these organisms don't do much of anything at all. Many of these are simply hitchhikers. They come in, hang around, maybe it's too warm, maybe it's a bit too dark, and off they go. A lot of the microorganisms in our gut play important functions with us. They are inextricably linked to our health. For example, Microbes in our gut help in the digestion of food and its breakdown, in its absorption of nutrients through the gut lining. They are also inextricably linked with our immune system, so important in fighting off and defending us from, other pa from pathogens and disease and illness. But microorganisms have so many roles with other animals and fish and insects. Let's take a few examples. The spiky puffer fish, it produces a toxin that the bacteria produce in its body so that when an animal comes and eats it, it wards it off. It, it's toxic to, the, to animals. The hoopo bird of Africa and Eurasia produces, well, uses bacteria to produce antimicrobial agents that it coats its eggs with to prevent pathogens from infiltrating into the eggs and harming the chicks. The ant lion, a larval stage beetle, it has these voracious jaws and it uses bacteria to produce a chemical that paralyzes its prey. The anglerfish of the deep sea, that beautiful monster of the deep, with its protrusion like, like, a, like a fishing tackle. At the end of that, it uses bacteria to produce an illuminescence to attract its its prey. Corals, they contain microscopic algae that provide nutrition to the corals. Without these microscopic algae, the corals would bleach and they would die. And they are just a few examples, but one that I really find quite fascinating. And for me, this symbiotic relationship of microorganisms with this squid, to me, is science fiction. This is the bobtail squid. You can place one on your palm of your hand. It is so cute, yet it holds a secret that's science fiction. When these bobtail squid hatch from their eggs, they begin a contract, a partnership for life, with a particular type of microbe that is called Vibrio fisheri. This bacteria enters inside the, a particular cavity within the mantle of the squid and colonizes it. The incredible evolution of the symbiosis is such that the squid will not allow any other bacteria to colonize this particular cavity. What happens is, when the squid emerges in the evenings to, to find food, it goes up into the water column, the illuminescence is turned on, and what happens is, it becomes invisible. That illuminescence cancels out the silhouette of the squid, so any predators below cannot see it against the, the night sky. It's an incredible defense mechanism to ward off any predators, basically conceal it. In the words of Professor Margaret McFarl Nagal of the United States, who has studied these squid for many years, this is a Klingon cloaking device. Now, I want you all to participate with me on this. Please close your eyes. And I want you to imagine that you are on a beautiful beach. No peeking. Imagine you're on a beautiful beach. It's warm. The sand is, is, is a beautiful white, but the water is inviting, and you, you are going to go in for a swim. But you're going to go in with a certain purpose in mind. What you've brought with you is a special device. It was invented a couple of days ago and you were the first to buy it. It's a special microscope that allows you to put it on, on your snorkel, 
and peer into the invisible world. You put it on, the water is warm, it's tranquil, and now you're about to see what's in this beautiful clear water. And this is what you see. Open your eyes. Life is teeming in this invisible world. You know, this, is, this image here is a drop of typical seawater, and it is teeming with life, with microscopic life. Every liter of seawater contains on average 10 billion viruses. These are the tiny little green dots that you see here. Every liter of seawater also contains on average 1 billion bacteria and archaea. This is another type of bacteria, but also somewhat dissimilar. And these are the rod-shaped <coughs> the rod-shaped particles that you see here. And some are spherical as well. And every liter of seawater contains hundreds to thousands of these microscopic algae, those phytoplankton that are so critical in producing that oxygen that you breathe in every second breath that you take. <coughs> but in the seawater, there is a type of bacteria that, uh, for which I have devoted most of my career. These bacteria are important in events like this, the famous historic Deepwater Horizon oil spill and many other oil spills that have occurred. The influx of oil into the ocean. Bacteria have a role in this and there is a particular type of bacteria. These are the oil degrading bacteria, the gas guzzlers of the ocean, those that munch and feed on oil and keep our oceans relatively clean. Barring these oil spills aside, hundreds of millions of litres of oil, crude oil, enter our oceans and seas every year naturally. Nothing to do with humans, naturally. And this has occurred for millions of years. In one year, that amount is enough to cover the seas and oceans in a thin layer of oil. Imagine over decades, imagine over hundreds of years, that is a hell of a lot of oil. Enough that the oceans and seas would, be, would appear quite black. However, our oceans and seas are not. They are relatively devoid of oil, except in places where there are these oil seeps or an oil spill has occurred. So we can thank goodness for these bacteria that exist in this ocean. Here is a photo here taken during the Deepwater Horizon spill. This is the oil slick. It was massive. It covered an area of almost the state of Virginia in the United States, there in the Gulf of Mexico. It's pretty. It looks almost in the genre of a painting of Edvard Munch, but this oil smells horrible. And it's full of toxic compounds and chemicals. And it had a huge impact in the Gulf. It killed fish and cetaceans. It affected and impacted corals and the livelihoods that depend on, on these. For example, it affected fisheries and various other economies, including tourism. BP spread dispersants into the Gulf of Mexico to try and break up the soil. The idea behind that is to prevent it from going to coastlines, but more importantly, to allow the oil deg degrading bacteria to break down this oil and faster. The idea is oil tends to Tend to, tends to either mass but also build up. The idea is to break it up into tinier and tinier droplets so that the bacteria can attack it and eat it faster. Well, this is an image that I took under the microscope showing you these tiny, tiny little droplets for, that formed in a laboratory simulated experiment with bacteria from the Gulf of Mexico. And they formed without the application of any of these chemicals, of these dispersants that BP or other um, uh, oil spill contingency authorities use during oil spills. These oil droplets were formed by the actions of bacteria. And if you, if you look here carefully, these white clouds, blue clouds that you see, cotton looking clouds, are the product of these bacteria. These bacteria produce these dispersing agents themselves. So it's almost as if it's not necessary to apply these dispersants as these occur naturally. 
So when there is an oil spill, these bacteria turn on and start producing these dispersants. And they're actually called, the term for these is surfactants. They're essentially a soap, soapy type of chemical that interacts with the oil and breaks it up. Essentially, these bacteria encode like a body shop, producing their own soaps. Now, this here shows you those bacteria interacting with these oil droplets by the action of these dispersants. The tiny green dots that you see are the bacteria attached to these clouds, and those are the oil droplets there that they are attacking and eating. Now, we have a project where we're trying to develop these surfactants that are produced by these bacteria to help battle oil spills. The idea being the dispersants that companies like BP and, 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 and other oil industry groups use to combat oil spills, these are chemically produced. They're synthetically produced in a laboratory. And they themselves can be toxic to marine organisms. So what we are trying to develop is something more natural, more natural types of these soaps so that when there, when there is an oil spill, we can use these in, tens of, in, in, in place of these chemicals. This here is an image of an oil degrading bacteria. Bacteria generally appear quite similar. They're difficult to distinguish under the microscope. We microbiologists have a keen eye for these things, but still, they mostly look very similar. In fact, these bacteria, which are oil degraders, isolated from the ocean, are very similar looking to the ones you have inside of you and all over us. But it's the functions that they, that they, that they do that are so critical and so important. These bacteria have important functions in the decomposition of matter, in, in the uptake of our nutrients and the various other functions that I've mentioned. They are critical to life on this planet. And them, like all these other microorganisms, like the microalgae and the phytoplankton that produce the oxygen, they are critical to life on this planet. We have messed with this planet too much. And we have to be very careful. If we mess with microbes that are at the base of the food chain, we are going to mess up with everything else. It is so important to sustain and try and keep our planet clean. Microbes are critical. And if we mess with them, it's going to be a big problem. Now, <clears throat> one thing I want to end with is when we think of new frontiers, we think of space. We think of the deep sea. But that new frontier is really all around us. It's inside of us. This invisible universe is everywhere. If only you can put on those goggles right now, if they exist to peer into this invisible world around us, you would see these bacteria and micro, my, other microorganisms everywhere, all around us. And they are so important to our health and to life on this planet. I hope you embrace them. Thank you.